Damascus Road podcast. On the road to Damascus, Paul had a radical encounter with Jesus and his life was changed forever. That is what we hope and pray for here. Now, on to this week's episode. Have you ever just directly bragged about buying something expensive? Been like this right here. See, Joss, good work, okay. Thanks for, thanks for being honest. I just called you out. I apologize. No one can see your hand. Devin, you will see this, this is good honesty. Okay, Gabby, good work. Okay, have you, any of you ever played the guess how much game? Oh, man, I'm, this is my favorite game. So we're going to play Ryan's version of guess how much. Are you guys ready? Apparently, according to Jimmy, I would fit right in with the Asian community based on this. Um, so this is my version of the guess how much game. First off, I took the kids to McDonald's after their last soccer practice this week. I don't know if you're aware of the allure of the Happy Meal to children, but it's like this tractor beam of power that draws them inexorably closer and produces a longing that only very small amounts of fries, a couple nuggets, and a cheap toy can satisfy. Even though they'd get way more food if I bought something like a Big Mac bundle, no, they want the Happy Meal. So when's the last time you checked the cost of a Happy Meal, right? I mean, I purchased, so this was a celebration, so each... Rule and Aiden and Catherine each got their own Happy Meal. So guess how much? Three Happy Meals. Now, I'd like to, to remind people that when you guess too low, you make me sad. Okay, so the lid. Wow, that's... <laughs> You have not been to McDonald's. I mean, it's not quite that bad yet, right? I'll complain about it. It's not that so the listed price of Happy Meals... Uh, the three Happy Meals I bought would have been $22. So that's what they normally, that's three Happy Meals. Like I said, like, like very small amounts of fries, like three nuggets and a toy. Um, and they give you like a milk, right? I paid $9 using McDonald's points to get one free. And then there was a coupon. You have to do separate transactions because you got to know how this works, right? A coupon, buy one, get one for $2. So I got three Happy Meals for $9, less than half off, feeling pretty good about myself. So let let me remind you again that as we play, if you guess too low, you will hurt my feelings. I need the validation from you that I got a good deal and the fake adulation that you give me. It can be lies. Just fake adulation warms my heart. Okay, round two. This is a full set of an extendable IKEA table in 10 shares. Now, this is one that I'm kind of famous for in our community. But if you are newer here or haven't heard the story, you get to play Guess How Much? And to keep the under 25 crowd from deeply offending me, furniture is way more expensive than you think it is. It's a pretty rude awakening, honestly, when you start actually buying furniture. So guess how much I purchased this huge extendable IKEA table and 10 chairs with removable covers that can be cleaned, put new ones on. Guess how much? Okay, 500, yep. 1,000? Okay, wow. If, If we were... If we were playing like the price is right, then, okay. So each chair with a cover retails, there were 10 of them, retails for $65, and I got 10 of them, so that's $650 right there. And the table is like another $500. So retail, $1,150. I paid $200 on Craigslist. Right, that's the right response. Thank you for making me feel good, even if it's fake. Yes, thank you, thank you. There was a realtor on, on Craigslist who'd gotten it for a staging of a house, and they're like, oh, I'll keep this. This is really nice. And they had it in the garage and never did anything with it. And then they just wanted it out. So I lucked into a $200 table. I, I once made the mistake. This was 2016. Uh, this is the year the Cubs won the World Series, the year my son Roland was born, and the year I got the table. And I said something foolish. This is what's been you know, lived on in infamy. Something like, man, I think getting this table might be the best thing that happened this year. <laughs> so yeah, that's why I get made fun of for the table. OK. Final round, final round. Here we go. Guess how much? So sabbatical vacation, Megan and I were on sabbatical a couple years ago. We spent five nights of the luxurious, all-inclusive Hyatt Ziva in Puerto Vallarta. All food and beverages are included at a secluded private beach. Round-trip, fli- round-trip flights from Tucson on American Airlines to Puerto Vallarta. So how much? Guess how much? <laughs> Trip from Tucson. Uh huh. So this is flights. This is transportation. This is lodging. Mm, mm-hmm. Okay. Okay, so five nights. This is in May. So five nights. 
retailed for $3,500. So if you want to know how much things like this are. The American Airline round trip flights that my wife and I were on was uh, $1,700. So the total was around $5,200 of retail. What did I actually pay? I actually paid $275. See, this is where you think I'm crazy. So that, that was airline fees and transportation to and from the airport, plus 166,000 American Airlines points and 91,000 Hyatt points. Now, I'm pretty proud of this last one. And if it sounds crazy or unbelievable, I'd be happy to introduce you to the world of credit card rewards some other time. And we could talk about how you too could take a $5,000 vacation for $275. But this is how my wife and I take vacations. Um, because otherwise, we would never take a vacation like that, ever. Um, but there are ways to do it. So, while I have certainly had some small successes that basically revolve around credit card rewards, coupons, not buying things that I can't afford, and saving so that when emergencies in life strike, they really aren't much of an emergency, I have also had plenty of money issues in my life. I've had some good things, I've had some bad things. I've bounced checks and overdrawn my checking account multiple times, not just once. Once you do it once, you'd think you would learn, but not me. Um, I've steered down the barrel of mounting bills and a minimal checking account, and I had to ask my family for help. Megan and I own a home, or really a mortgage company owns our home, and in just 23 short years, it'll be all ours. But I used to own another home, emphasis on used to. Faced with a huge change in my personal and financial situation, I resorted to what's known as a short sale, which is one step just before foreclosure and eventual bankruptcy. A short sale is the sale of a house where the bank agrees to accept whatever you can sell the house for as their compensation and forgive the rest of the mortgage debt to avoid the hassle of legal fees and them having a house they don't want in foreclosure. And this was incredibly common in the, the housing crisis about 15 years ago. So I bought, this is the reverse of guess how much. I bought my house, say 15 years ago, for maybe a little bit longer than that, $210,000, and I sold it for around $120,000, like the opposite of guess how much, right? And while my credit took a major hit for a few years, I didn't have to pay the difference, right? That's $90,000. The bank forgave $90,000 debt just to get something out of the house so that they don't have to deal with it. And that was very common. All that to say that my financial history is far from spotless. And I bet that yours, no matter how long you've been alive, has had a few hiccups and hurdles along the way. Maybe you're like me and you've dealt with bad decisions, not having enough money to cover your bills. Maybe you've gotten into crazy credit card debt, bought items you couldn't afford even a little bit, had your car repossessed, or your wages garnished, or realized that your education that you took out loans to pay for wasn't going to deliver a job that would cover those loans anytime soon. Or maybe money has always been easy for you, but you struggle with the need for more, for the desire to have the newest, coolest gadget or clothing, a bigger house or bigger boat or car, and money is what you are turning to to deliver a better life. Maybe money is how you keep score in life, and you have to make it to the next level, to the next success to find ultimate security. If only I had this, then I will have arrived. So whether you need more or want more, all of us need to find freedom from money and recognize the truth that we could all use a little help. We need help here not just to manage life well, but to move from anxious, greedy, or miserly to trusting, peaceful, joyful, and generous. And this isn't just about having a better life. This is about discovering what life itself is really about. And the truth is that money and how we spend our money reveals our hearts. What we spend our money on shows, perhaps better than anything else in life, what we really believe and value and care about. Jesus says that it shows us what we treasure, and even more importantly, who our master is. Now, if I asked you who your master is, which is a weird thing to ask today, but let's say we were having that conversation, who you want to serve first and foremost, I imagine at a church that many of us would say, yeah, God, God's my master. The question is, would our bank account actually reflect that statement? Or does it reveal that we don't really trust God to provide for us, to meet our needs, 
or to change the world with the amount of money we give to his kingdom work? Would our bank statements look any different from people who haven't been changed by the love of Jesus? Would it reveal a trusting, peaceful, and generous heart? And the truth is we have to make some changes in this area to become the people God made us to be and we say we want to be or we will discover over time that our money is in control of us and not the other way around. And Jesus is very clear that money is not the sort of master that we want to serve. And this is an issue that God cares about. He cares so much about it that the Bible addresses the topic of money over 2,000 times. Generosity and good stewardship reflect a heart centered on our Heavenly Father, and Jesus cautions us that finances can be a great challenge to spiritual growth. So this morning, we'll start in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' most famous block of teaching. It's mostly, in many ways, Jesus' manifesto describing what his followers should look like and how his new way of living, how the kingdom of God is expressed tangibly in the world. And money is a part of it. This is what he says, starting in verse 19 of the sixth chapter of Matthew. Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. So Jesus jumps immediately to the crux of the issue here. Everything that we acquire, the money and possessions, the success and the accolades, we can't take them with us. They're temporary. But if we confuse what is temporary for what is eternal, and spend our lives storing up earthly treasures, we will miss out on the life that is truly life. We cannot control the challenges that we will face, and we could be devoting ourselves to things that will be taken or stolen or desert us in life. And if they don't leave us in this life, they certainly will in the next. Things are temporary. People are eternal. Treasure accordingly. And we know this is true, don't we? Like there have been countless movies. Even Hollywood tells us this, right? A Christmas Carol in all of its iterations. Confessions of a Shopaholic, The Wolf of Wall Street, American Hustle, The Upside, everything, everywhere, all at once. And it could go on. Like all these movies are making these same points over and over again. But before any of these movies came out, Jesus told the story this way. He said, a rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. And he said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. Then he said, oh, I know. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones. Then I'll have room enough to store all my wheat and other goods. And I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, you will die this very night. Then who will get everything you worked for? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. Jesus' point here is quick and clear. There is one thing that matters above all others, and it's not money. It's having a rich relationship with God. Now, have you known anyone kind of like the rich man? Have you known anyone who devoted their lives to accumulating money or possessions or success at the expense of their families? and ended their lives alone and discovered that they can't take any of it with them. And maybe none of us are there. Maybe we don't know anyone like that. But if we aren't careful, it's not too hard to end up there. Whether it's pursuing money or success or the accolades of peers, we place our whole lives on the altar of what we desire. And in the end, we discover that we've lost our lives and more. Jesus says that we are fools when we devote ourselves to the wrong things that do not deliver. And when we do this, we show the truth about what we really value. Jesus goes on, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Whatever we spend our time on, whatever we talk about and work toward, whatever we are treasuring, that's where our hearts are. And it shows that we are often treasuring the wrong things. It reveals who our true master is. Things are temporary. People are eternal. Treasure accordingly. 
So what is it that you are focusing on? Is it on being rich towards God? Or is it on something else? What are your eyes focused on? Jesus cautions us this way. Your eye is a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is good, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is bad, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep the darkness is. Jesus' point is that what we focus on, what our eyes are fixed on, can provide us with light and life or darkness and death. If our focus is on money and success or pleasure, it may seem good for a while, but it will not ultimately satisfy and certainly will not give us true life both now and in eternity. With our eyes fixed on God, however, our worries will reduce, peace and faith will grow, worship will come more easily, and our lives will be more marked by generosity. Jesus sums up this teaching this way. No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And this term money in the original language is mammon, which is not just money in the sense that things we spend, but rather kind of like the animating force that's driving this inner desire that we have for more, for money that gives us security. So he's really saying there is, you're choosing between God and instead serving mammon. And it's not just money, it's this bigger, uh, concerning kind of evil thing um, that is not wanting you to go that way. So. So this is the question, who is your master? Is it your pocketbook, your success, your ability to have fun? Or is your master God? And if we say that God is our master, are we concerned with being rich towards God or are we primarily concerned with being rich in this life? If we want to see alignment between our words and our actions here, we need to understand what being rich towards God really looks like. And I think there are lots of dimensions to this. It includes becoming a person of character and integrity, full of generosity and love. And the greatest thing that God receives from you in this life is the person that you become. It means discovering your gifts and talents and understanding how God designed you to impact the world and make it a better place. It means cherishing people and enjoying their company. It means living a life that's worth living and inviting God's kingdom to earth with your words and your actions. It means making sure that the temporary things in life are the servant of the eternal ones and not the other way around. Things are temporary. People are eternal. Treasure accordingly. And Jesus sums up the center of a life that's rich towards God this way. He says it's centered on love. The great commandment, the center of spiritual life is this. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is equal. Love your neighbor as yourself. Everything else is detail and is expansion on this center of loving God and loving others. So just as we express love to people, we express our love for God and spending time with him and serving him. More than anything else, more than gifts and flowers, more than doing the dishes or cleaning the house, more than fun vacations that cost less than they should or dates, Megan wants to spend time with me. She wants to be with me. And I can't come up with a solution or a situation where our love will grow without spending time together. And our relationship with God is the same way. We were made to be with God, and he has given us many gifts, but the greatest gift God gave us is himself. All throughout the Bible, we read stories of people who were with God. He walked in the cool of the day with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, He was with Enoch and Noah, Abraham and Isaac. He was with Joseph in his slavery and in prison and when he's elevated in Egypt. God made a people, the Israelites, so he could be their God and dwell with them. But God had wanted to be with everyone, both physically and spiritually. So one day, 2,000 years ago, a baby was born. And Jesus grew and he taught and he invited people to follow him, to be with him. And he said that God would dwell with those who loved and obeyed and followed him. And still today, the Holy Spirit takes up residence with all those who follow Jesus. And God still whispers to you and to me, I want to be with you. 
And the truth is, in life, we cannot make ourselves love anyone more. It's not an act of will. You can't just say, today, I will love this person more. It's something that happens when we spend time with them. And they reveal themselves to be wonderful and incredible and perfect for us. So we say that we fall in love because we can't help it. But we fall in love because we spent time with someone. And it works the same way with God. We can't make ourselves love him more. We choose instead to get to know him better. We can ask him to be with us when we awake. We can see him in creation and hear his voice as we read the Bible and pray as we talk to our friends. We can ask for help while we work and ask for forgiveness when we mess up. And we can end our days rejoicing that we spent time with him. When we spend time with God, we can't help but fall more in love because God is the source of all life and love. We can't force it to happen, but we can spend time with God. And as we do it, we will find that we are living a life that is rich towards God. Now, I recently bought a new phone as my old one has become less and less functional because I have dropped it and my children have dropped it and now it's cracked and the bottom half of it just is a bright white light half the time, which is really hard to deal with. Um, and my new phone, which I am, well, it should be showing up on Monday, so I don't have it yet, um, will be cool and new and exciting when I get it on Monday, right? And my old phone, like, ah, who even cares about this old phone anymore? I have a new phone. But those feelings will fade because it's temporary. My cool computer or watch or furniture, they're great now. But I'll want something different soon. And I think you will too, it's not just me. They're temporary. That car you're driving around, it's temporary. The fashionable clothes that you may or may not be wearing, temporary. The house you're saving up for that you're living in now, it's temporary. And if this is what we are living for, all that we will receive is temporary pleasure, temporary joy, temporary meaning, and it will end, but we will not, and we will be left empty again looking for something else to fill us, but there is something in this room that is not temporary, and it's you, and it's me. To have a life that is rich in God's eyes, we have to choose to value the eternal over the temporary, and that's people. We are cleverly designed and disguised receptacle for eternity. Your family, your friends, the person sitting next to you, all eternal. The stranger you pass on your way to church today, the kids playing in the park, eternal. The person you dislike the most in the world, the person you wish wasn't here this morning, they are all eternal. Things are temporary. People are eternal, treasure accordingly. At the end of our earthly lives, the eternal will last. God, other people, ourselves. And our acts of love towards those who are eternal will echo into eternity. We don't take anything with us except for the love. The love is eternal. So let's choose the eternal. Let's choose the love. Let's choose being rich towards God instead of just wealth here and now. Now, finding freedom from pursuing the wrong kinds of wealth is more than just a mindset change. It impacts our bank statements as well. Just as God has given us the spiritual practice of Sabbath to learn to live in rhythm with our time and schedules, he has given us the practice of tithing to help us understand that everything we have is a gift from God and will be ultimately returned to him. Tithing is the exercise and the action that we can take to develop a trusting, God-centered, generous heart when it comes to our money and possessions. So we're gonna have a little aside about tithing. Tithe is kind of a weird word, and it means a tenth part or 10%. It was a foundational part of life in Israel for the people God had chosen for himself to show his love and ways to the world. Leviticus 27.30 says it this way. A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. Now, people today, I think, get hung up on the 10% for many reasons. Some people feel like, oh, this is the aspiration. This is the goal, 10%. But the real goal, the goal for God is a generous, trusting heart that is rich towards God. 
That's the goal, a trusting, generous heart. In, and in Israel, if we want to get our history right, 10% was only the beginning. There were actually three tithes collected from Israel. 10% went to support the priests and Levites. Another 10% went for sacred celebrations. And then every three years, they gave another 10% to support the poor, the orphans, and the widows. So to summarize, Israel gave more like 23% every year. 10% should not be viewed as a ceiling in giving. It's more like the floor. Because we have to give enough to actually reorder our hearts. Now many Christians today like to say things like, tithing is in the Old Testament. It's a part of the law, so we can disregard it now because times have changed. Or they claim that they are tithing in other ways. This is probably my favorite. With their time and talents. But they don't do anything financially. When we fail to tithe financially, we reveal that we do not trust God with our money and our provision. We certainly should be giving people in all areas, time, talent, and finances, not just one or two. But Jesus was very clear that he did not come to abolish the law, but rather to fulfill it. And in response to Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, in response to how he had transformed them, and in response to God's incredible gifts, because everything is his in the first place, the early church went far beyond the tithe of 10%. The letter of the law was 10%, or if we're, if we're honest, it's actually more like 23%. But the heart of the law, the heart of the law that God wants to produce in us is generosity. In this way, tithing is like training wheels, right? It's how we start and how we learn to be generous. And you can take off those tri training wheels when it's keeping you from riding free. 10% is the best place to start, but it's not the end goal. It's a bit like the minimum basic requirement. The prophet Malachi talked about the failure to tithe as robbery, as stealing from God. He said it this way, you have cheated me of the tithes and offerings due to me. You are under a curse, for your whole nation has been cheating me. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great that you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. When we don't tithe, we fail to be people of trust and generosity that God longs for us to be. Perhaps money has been hard for you. Maybe you feel like you can never get ahead. And maybe some practical help is needed in this area. And if that's the case, we would love to help you on that journey. We offer classes periodically. We'd love to set you up with a mentor who can help you in this area. But it's also possible that we need to trust God with our money and begin the practice of tithing either way. And maybe, just maybe you'll discover that God will do what he says and that you will experience blessings. With the tithe, God is in effect saying that 90% of your income with my blessing is more than 100% of your income without it. You will discover that you have more than enough and you will grow in trust and cultivate a generous heart. And this is one area in the Bible where God tells us to test him, to try it out and see. Everything we have comes from God and tithing is not a burden or a rule, but one of God's greatest gifts, a practice to develop trusting, generous, God-centered hearts. Pastor and author John Ortberg says this about tithing. God invites human beings into an experiment. He challenges people to test it. At the same time, failure to tithe is called robbery. Tithing is not the last word in generosity, it's the first word. But it's a word that God takes with deep seriousness. Perhaps because when human beings get vague about finances, they grow deeply evasive. And I don't know about you, but I've been evasive in my life about money. And I want to be open about that. There were times that I did not tithe at all. Now, I was raised tithing. Um, you know, this is perhaps one of the bad things about us not actually passing offering plates. But the offering plates would go by at church, and my parents would give us allowance. But part of our allowance, part of what we would do is we would put it in the, in the plate. So I grew up practicing that all the time. I knew that that's, that's how this works. I have money, but I need to be generous with it. But when I got to college, I stopped because I wasn't making any money. At least that's what I told myself. The truth was, I didn't make any money when I was a little kid either. 
I was tithing on the money my parents gave me, which God had given them. Nothing had really changed. And if we want to be legalistic about it, I bet the money they gave me, they tithed on first. So like, I mean, how many tithes are happening? The point is not, the point is not to overthink it. The point is what's helping me develop a generous heart, right? And so the money I receive, um, the question I ask, um, or that I would encourage you to ask, well, let's, I'll say it this way. I still had money in college. I wasn't, getting, I wasn't working, but I still had money. I was still spending money and going to movies and eating out and buying video games. Um, so if you don't make much or have a job, I encourage you to ask yourself this. If I am spending money, am I using any of it for God's kingdom work? I think that's the question that I needed to ask when I was in college. If I'm spending money, which I was, am I using any of it for God's kingdom work? Or is it really just all about me eating out and going to movies and buying video games? Because that's really what I, I don't know what you do with your money. That's what I did with mine. Um, now, I did not have this attitude when I was in college, but I wish that I did. I wasn't trusting God with my money and provision. And it wasn't until I was out of college that I started tithing again. And I will be honest that I have never once regretted it. I've had some lean times, certainly, but tithing is a part of my life now. It's not a part of my income. It's the first part that I receive and I offer to God. Trusting him that 90% of my income with his blessing is more than 100% of my income without it. And the truth is, Megan and I give more than 10%. We give here to Damascus Road. We support Tyler and Devin. Um, who are ministers here, and we support missionaries who are serving God elsewhere. So we give more like 15%, but maybe 23% is the aspiration. Like, like not in a legalistic way, but in a way that says, like, am I actually tangibly growing in generosity? Where I could say, like, I could prove that I actually care about someone other than myself if I looked at my checkbook. Or my bank statement. It's not like I have a checkbook. Who has checkbooks anymore, right? Um, not legalistically, but joyously. We trust God, and I have never had reason to doubt God in that process. And I don't believe that you will either. Again, God says, test me in this. See that if it's true. I don't tell you this for any reason other than to be transparent about what we do with our money. Other people in the church do different things. And we encourage you to sort through what the right thing for you to do is in this area. Um, but I do believe that as you begin this practice that you will be more trusting and generous and God-centered because of it, because that's been our experience. And it isn't the end of the giving, it's just the beginning. I invite you to join us in this adventure to accept God's invitation in this area. This is the passage that our series comes from. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. For God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. God provides. You will have all that you need with more to share. So give cheerfully and joyfully as God guides you and the Spirit prompts you and see how your trust and faith and peace will grow. Test the way of Jesus in this area. The invitation is to taste and see that God is good and to discover if God is serious about what he says. Now, I believe that the Bible is very clear that you should be tithing to your spiritual home. And this practice is way more about you than it is about the church. I want you to tithe for you, for your growth and the adventure of trust and generosity that God will take you on when you begin to obey him in this area. Now, to be fully transparent about what we do with money here, the tithes that come in are going to pay for the rooms that we meet in, the table toppers, decor around the room, um, the water table, the food bank, the hospitality, and much more. About 55% of what comes in uh, is used for church growing, church building activities. And the other 45% that, that comes in is used to support great organizations like Caring Ministries, who we partnered together for the food bank, um, goes to aid in Ukraine, and we have missionaries in the U.S. and Mexico and Haiti as well. We try very hard to honor God with the money that you entrust us with. I do not get paid by the tithes and offerings that are given to our church, nor does any of our staff. We could not pay our salaries if we wanted to. When I 
before I moved to Tucson to start the church, when I met with people and invited them to partner with me so this could be a reality, I said, I have no idea if we will ever be self-sustaining. I have no idea if we will ever get enough money from the people who come to our church because our target is the college campus community, which means that inherently, like even though you might have money, right, it's not the same as, as someone who's working a full, full-time job, right, um, which doesn't mean that you, you can pay things, pay, pay, or you can give in the same way that someone who has a more robust resources is able to do, right? Um, but we're open about where our money goes. Brad or I could pull up the church budget if you, if you wanted to see it. Um, but I will say that one of the things that in the past has made me deeply uncomfortable with the church is the amount of money that is given and then spent only on themselves. So we're weird. Like, we do a lot of things differently here. If, you, if you've been to churches, we do some weird things, right? Um, and one of them is that most churches, at least 90% of the tithes and offerings go to overhead and staff salaries. So most churches you go to, most of the money given pays for the building and the staff of the church. And then they operate the church entirely out of the remaining 10%, which also means it's really hard to be generous. So when we say 45% of our money um, is going out and 55% is, is actually running the church, that includes a little bit of overhead, but it doesn't include anybody's salary, that kind of stuff. So it's, it's the kind, like we do money in a way that I'm happy to support. That I know that if, if you look behind the curtain and, at us or any other church in town, you would say, you know what, I'm proud that I give money here because I know what they're doing with it. And I know that the most of it is going towards ministry and really good things. Um, that said, as, as I said, there, we have a unique setup where our ministers, so me, Devin, and Tyler, are supported separately from our church budget. So like I said, before I moved here to plant the church, I met with churches and individuals and invited them to partner with us so I could do this with all of my time. Um, Because otherwise I'd have to work a job, um, a different sort of job to pay the bills, which would reduce the amount of time I have to be here. Um, And we operate on a budget of about $40,000 a year. So that's the total budget our church has for what we do. So if you think about me, Tyler, and Devin, like being able to to live and buy, buy food and, and those sorts of things. Like, we couldn't pay one of us for $40,000 a year, right? Um, so that's why we, we operate differently, which allows most college-connected churches, of which there are more and more, in, work this way, where their staff raise separate support um, because the financial reality looks different. Most churches of the poor work this way. So there are particular kind of groups of people that have to be funded in a different way. Um, but it's also why most churches in America are family churches, because that's where the money is. And that can fund everything, right? So we're trying to do something different. It works differently. Um, and there are lots of great organizations you can support. They're doing great work. Megan and I support our church. We support missionaries. We support other organizations. Um, but the fact that our church operates on such a small amount, like I said, our total budget right now is $40,000 a year, um, means that giving here goes further and has a greater impact on what we're able to do together as a community. So your $100 a month, to be practical, to the awesome global mission and relief organizations that we support, and I do this too, is a drop in the bucket of their multi-million dollar budgets. $100 a month to our church that operates on a $40,000 a year budget um, actually moves the needle in what we're able to do together as a community. So this is me being very, very transparent. I I think you should give money to great organizations. I do it too. Um, But because we work differently, there is a unique impact you can have if you actually decide to give here or to tangibly support someone like Devin or Tyler. So I want to encourage you, it's going to be a very practical Sunday, to consider what it might look like for you to tithe. Whatever that looks like for you, if you're someone who's just spending money, what does it look like to say, is a little bit of my money going to something that that God cares about in the world? How can I worship God with my money and form myself in the way of someone who's trusting and begin to discover financial freedom in the way of Jesus? And as we close, I want to again encourage you, as we embark on this journey together, towards trust, towards being rich towards God, which is the goal, towards having a generous heart, Let's keep the end goal in mind. This is 1 Timothy 6, one of my favorite passages. Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works, 
and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasures as a good foundation for the future so they may experience true life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the chance to gather to consider how to center our hearts on you and see that impact all aspects of our lives, not just a Sunday morning, but our lives every day, um, including our finances, Lord. We thank you that every good and perfect gift we have comes from you. And we recognize that you are the one who provides. Um, And we want people who are thankful, who also understand that the blessings you've given us don't exist only for ourselves, but we're blessed to be a blessing. And that that's the call and the way of Jesus is not to hoard our blessing, but we're blessed to be a blessing to others. Help us to begin to be slightly less evasive, God, and be a little bit more honest about what we're doing with our money and how that reflects where our heart is. And we want to grow there. We know that this growth comes not through mere willpower, but through spending time with you. So change our hearts, Lord. Help us to center more and more on your way, Jesus. In your holy and precious name I pray. Amen. Thank you for joining the Damascus Road Podcast. Our mission is to follow Jesus together by being with God, loving everyone, transforming people, developing leaders, growing new ministries, and changing the world. You can find out more about us online at damascusroadtucson.com.